This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their taproom in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we're talking with Burlington, Vermont's Switchback Brewing. I'm Tim Dennis, and with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Brian Hewitt. Hey, Tim. Joining us today, we have Bill Cherry, the founder of Switchback Brewing Company. We're going to talk about smoked beers, the switch to 100% employee ownership, and beers that don't easily fall into style categories. Bill, thanks for joining us. Hey, good to see you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Bill, we are drinking your Switchback L right now, which we talked a little bit before we got on. This is just a good drinking beer, right? Just a, a balanced amber ale. So something you can set down, don't have to overthink or just enjoy your beer, right? That's right. It's a, it's actually a beer that I like to think uh, sneaks complexity past you because it's just so stinking smooth. That's it. That's sneaky, stealthy complexity. You need it's it, man. Right you past need that. You. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that rewards you. Like, if you don't want to think about it, you can enjoy it. But if you do, if you're in the mood, if you're mood for a thinking beer, you could probably think about that while you're drinking you it, can. too. A thinking beer or a drink beer. It's multi-purpose. Yeah, yeah exactly. multi-purpose beer. <laughs> It was always one of my favorite parts in the early days where I'd have a bartender who'd been carrying it for a couple of years and all of a sudden they'd pull me aside and say, you know, I've been drinking this for two years. I love it and everything. But the other day I was drinking it and I, I swear I got like the taste of like peaches and I just kind of smile and it's like, it was always there. It was there. Just, yeah. yeah. You just had to look <laughs> for it. It's like that meme. It's always has been. Wait, no, that's, it gets dark real quick. Never mind. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you, you're right. You know what? Like you said, it's, it's got the complexity and the flavor there, but. If you don't want to overthink it, just sit down and enjoy it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got to enjoy that. Bill, so you have been at this for 20 years now. Is that correct? That's right. As far as the, the, the switchback. Company. Okay. All right. How did you get started in brewing? So brewing, I did it in our world in an unusual way. I didn't know any better. And it's going to show my age here. But um, I was plugging away at a degree in microbiology that I was trying to use to get into the beer industry. And when I was trying to get in... This was like the 1980s, so I was trying to work at Budweiser or something, anything. And that wasn't cutting it, but a nice gentleman from Coors, actually, I wrote to them and I wrote to their research and development and said, what's a guy got to do to get into the brewing industry? And he sent me a personal letter and said, learn more. And uh, just like that, I was off to uh, University of California in Davis for a brewing education. Okay. Lots of great brewers have gone through all UC Davis there, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So microbiology itself was not enough. You needed to go another step beyond. And this was back in the 80s, too. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. The big guys were just like, if you don't have a PhD, we don't want to talk to you. But, you know, and I hit Northern California up there at UC Davis, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm surrounded by Anchor and Sierra Nevada and Mendocino, and all the students were talking about working for small brewers that where I came from in Ohio, we didn't have one. It was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. So I went through there and, and it came out with a master's degree in beer brewing, which is just fun to say, and got a job with uh, Boulevard Brewing in Kansas City. Okay. Yeah. That's, see, I've heard a lot of d discussions, you know, that the term brewmaster, some breweries use that fairly loosely. You know, are you the head brewer? Are you the brewmaster? You know, they talk about the education of that. Some people aren't so set on that. Others are very particular. We've had brewers that are the head brewer. And I'll say, you're the brewmaster. Like, no, no, no. There's a lot that goes along with that. I'm the head brewer. So yeah, get out there yeah. and get that education, get informed. You know, Bill, something interesting, uh, the way we got connected up is one of our friends, uh, Michael Syrop, who is actually half of Rainy Day Brewery, the home brewery uh, slash brewery and planning. He had reached out to you with some help formulating a smoked beer that they were brewing. And uh, I actually got to try that beer this weekend, Bill. So oh, the, really? Yeah, they did a smoked Kentucky Common. And uh, he had told me that he was talking to you about the recipe, and he said, how much should we use in this? Like 5%? You're like, oh, no, 25%. Like, go for it. So he, And the, <laughs> the smoke note came out. It's noticeable, but it's not overpowering in the beer. It's actually, it was, it was a very good beer. Good. I'm glad to yeah, hear that. Yeah. Fun to check that out. Yeah, you, you learn pretty quickly, and I know we're going to have lots of conversation about smoke, but you learn oh, yes. pretty quickly that if it's peated malt, 
five percent is might be too much but if it's you know german you know beechwood then then you can jack it up a quite a bit interesting see not, yeah. not all smoke is created equal we just realized and bill yeah. i will share this with you now we are divided on our love of smoke beers here so <laughs> brian is a fan i am of all of them as a generality i am not but i do like the hints of smoke like i said that kentucky common was good but Bill, I am here today to be converted. That's what I'm here for. I'm ready for it. The Church so, of Smoke. The Church of Smoke. I, I'm ready for my conversion, for my baptism in smoke there. <laughs> All right. We'll work on you. Okay, you know, we'll get there. One thing I got to ask about, I saw it on the website. Are you a fan or a player of curling? I saw a picture of, uh, I think you on a <laughs> curling team. It looked like curling, and that's something that I'd completely forgotten about because you, uh, you don't see Absolutely. that kind of thing. You don't see that thing outside of the Olympics maybe down here. So. That's right. But, you know, we're in the Great White North up here. You got to embrace yeah. it. It's actually a, there's a charity event, you know, pre-COVID time, a charity event for uh, that they let you go out and actually curl in a tournament. And the switchback sweepers uh, were champions one year, I'd like to say. <laughs> We've gotten pretty good at it, actually, uh, to the point where we actually have to think about strategy. Whereas in the beginning, if you get it anywhere close to the circle, <laughs> you're, you're just giving you're yourself good, high right? fives. Yeah, sure. Brian, there's actually an Atlanta curling league and they do a brewers competition each year. Oh, and then so they I don't think that, of course, with everything, I don't think they got Probably, to do it last year, yeah. but uh, they've actually reached out to us before. The first time they reached out, we just couldn't make it over. But like, hey, guys, come over. I'm like, that sounds like fun. That would be something. Cool I would to check, check it out. out. <laughs> That's yeah. really interesting. For sure. Well, you know, Tim, I think we need to get into the beers of the week. Now it's time for our beers of the week brought to you by The Nest Craft Beer and Barbecue in downtown Kennesaw, Georgia. The Nest well, Brian, as always, we've got a great beer list to get into. Lots of smokiness today to check out. Uh, we're going to have a good time with it. We do want to thank The Nest for sponsoring this segment. Kennesaw, Georgia, beer and barbecue, 48 taps. Really nice seller list. Great pimento cheese and pork rinds, Brian. Oh, so, yeah. So yeah. if you're in the mood for some of that. Smoked wings, and too. some smoked wings, mm. check them out. So, Bill, thank you again for the excellent package that you sent to us. We've got some great beers here to enjoy. We're really enjoying the Switchback Ale right now, and we're going to get smoky after this. We have the Barrel Aged Blackstrap Ale, which is a smoked beer, part of the Flint on Fire series. We have the, Bill, how do I pronounce this? Basuni? Basune? Bizune. Bizune Chardonnay Barrel Aged Saison. I'm excited about that one, Bill. I'll be yes. honest. I can't wait to check that <laughs> one out. And we also have a little Uncle Dunkle that we're going to get into as we dive into the smokiness. So, Brian, what's happening this week? In the news. What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so it's been a rough week for Stone Brewing Company. Stone has agreed to pay in excess of $1.8 million to the TTB, according to Brewbound. And that number is actually a compromise with the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau for alleged tax reporting and payment violations. According to the TTB, Stone is accused of underpaying some of their taxes, not paying others, and incorrectly using lower tax rates for the taxes they do pay. Additionally, they are accused of things like filing and paying taxes late, and in some cases, just not supplying enough information. So these alleged violations apparently took place at four different Stone facilities around the country, including their Escondido, California, and Richmond, Virginia production facilities. According to a spokesperson from Stone, they say they made an honest mistake and had no ill intentions. So they're going to make good on it. Yeah. Fix it up, Stone. My favorite news of the week, Sierra Nevada set a Guinness record with the a keg and a trebuchet, which means we are one giant step closer to my dream of trebuchet beer delivery system, <laughs> especially was. in these times. You know, I that. think yeah. that was one of our first COVID shows last year because yes. we were talking about alternative ways to get beer into people's hands. Yeah, people were using drones, and I'm like, why not trebuchet? Why not a trebuchet? Especially, yeah. it was like a, a pub in, in the U.K. somewhere where people were in the neighborhood. Just trebuchet over to them. Brian, Sierra Nevada is there for you. That's right. They hurled that keg 438 feet, beating the previous record of 253 feet. And it was to uh, mark the launch, get it, of Big Little Thing IPA. So uh, no beer was wasted. It was actually filled with water, so they okay. did not harm it. It was the keg. The launch and the beer was not the important part. But that part, was the right? important part. The keg full of some liquid up to about 44 pounds. Did you see that? Did you watch the video? I did, and I saw it was like 45 minutes long, and I didn't have time they did. to, to watch it. I skipped around. Yeah. There's one part where they've got like a truck and trailer trailer, and I guess they took the top off of it like an aluminum can, but I think there was once they like made a basket into that trailer there. So it was oh. a, a pretty <laughs> impressive throw there. I'm yeah. going to have to watch it, though. Yeah, you have to yeah. check it out. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Switchback Brewing.
Have you ever thought about owning your own brewery but don't know what it takes to get one built? We're Storytime Construction, and we build breweries. We're Georgia's most experienced and hands-on contractors when it comes to building new breweries and tap rooms or expanding existing breweries. We offer full build-outs, remodeling, and additions, as well as consulting and construction management. Give us a call at 770-733-4343. Storytime Construction. We build breweries. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next Friday is Hawaiian Shirt Day. So, you know, if you want to, go ahead and uh, wear a Hawaiian shirt and jeans. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember, all episodes are available on demand. So if you missed the broadcast, get the podcast. Beer Guys Radio is available on all popular and unpopular podcasting apps. Now, let's get back into it. Some smoke talk. Some switchback brewing. You know, I don't want people who come here for the smoke talk to be disappointed. We're going to get into that. But we figured that we'd cover some other things before we just get neck deep into the smoke. So, Bill, one thing we want to talk about, kind of an interesting setup there for with switchback, your brewery is 100% employee-owned, correct? We are, as of 2017. Okay. that's a, What made you decide to, to go that direction with the brewery? I consider that kind of a, a great uh, a gift from my mentors like John McDonald at Boulevard Brewing and, and Larry Bell and some of these, these originators who, uh, you know, a few years back said the one mis- biggest mistake they made was it never occurred to them that they were going to have to retire and they didn't plan on their secession. And so that got me working on it at an earlier, at an earlier pace. And uh, ESOPs, as they call them, are pretty popular up here in Vermont. So there's a lot of information you can gather. And it really came down to looking at it saying, do I really want to work this until I die and then have to give it to just some stranger? Or can I give it to the folks that are uh, doing all this hard work with me and and really know the brand and will carry it on the way in my heart of hearts I would like it to be carried on. That's a really smart way to go. You sure, are absolutely. You are priming everybody to take over all at the same time the entire time you're working there. It's actually kind of genius. I, I never really thought about it until now. I'm like, he's giving it all to them. I'm like, it, it could go to his kids, but maybe his kids don't care. They're going to have some other things that they want to go do or they may not get into brewing, so there's no guarantee of these things. And you know, you never know what the future is. You never holds, know. You never but know. But you have people that are vested in the interest of continuing this brewery, and they're going to be ready to take it over because they're already doing it. So that's really. I got to tell you, one of the great benefits I had early on was, you know, we're in a meeting and we're making a a, a momentous decision of, you know, a direction the company's going to go, and I sat back and went. I'm not the one that has to live with this. So you guys better <laughs> yeah, think hard. <laughs> I'm doing this. So when I get out of here, this is for yeah. you guys. So <laughs> were there any challenges in setting that up that maybe you didn't expect or if another brewery or company is looking to do something like this? What are some of the challenges that you face going into that? There are dead honesty. If it wasn't for my sincere overriding desire to make this happen, it's difficult to do uh, legally. There's six figures of lawyers' fees trying to, to Shoot, yeah. make this all happen because yeah, a, a trust owns it, and I still don't understand. But I'm reporting to a trust now, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, and you have to be a certain kind of brewery that's still, uh, you know, it's helpful if you're in in a stable condition or at least or in, in a growth position is even better to bring it on and you know have the right staff. You know, and I was already running the brewery kind of like an ESOP in that I always involved everybody in my decisions and why I was making decisions and whatnot and and what I always wanted us to feel like we were a team because I enjoy that. So it fit together really well for us. You know, I know there's a big group of people out now that are just really anti-work, anti-company, anti-corporation. 
And, you know, there's companies that you work for and they're like, we're a family here and this and that. And there's a big mindset that that's a negative, that they're trying to say, you know, they, they own you, you know, hey, don't believe this. But I'll tell you this. I've worked for some companies where they have that mentality and it does help people if they mean it, if it's not just a catchphrase. They take figurative and literal ownership of what they do, and they believe in things more if they have a piece of it. So sure. as long as a company doesn't just set that up on paper and kind of lives that mentality, it's really great for morale to be part of that. You care totally. about how things turn out if you have a piece of the sure, action. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got yeah. something to lose, you know? We have a kind of, it's more than a, a joke at this point because we have it like all surrounding the can about our, we say we're the 100% company. We're 100% unfiltered. And we're 100% Vermont made. We're 100% employee owned. But, um, you know, it's, it's like it's all in. And, you know, I, I always get a, real enjoyment when a visitor to the brewery comes in and they'll comment at some point, you know, and they can just be a tourist in the tap room or they could be, you know, somebody that, that you're working with from, you know, an outside vendor type thing. And they'll say, man, you can just feel that everybody likes being here. <laughs> we just feel it. Yeah, you can with companies. I mean, I think about it sometimes even with something as simple as like grocery stores. You go to a Walmart True. here, yeah. everyone's miserable. Yeah. No one wants to be there. No one wants to be there. But you know, go you go to Chick-fil-A, which is, that's a religion down here, by the way, Bill, if you want. <laughs> yes, Chick-fil-A is a religion. It kind of is, yeah. But uh, they're, they're almost on the verge of like cult-like happy and cheerful there. So you can see the way a company's run. By the way, you know, even huge corporations right down to the store level, you know, it goes up the food chain and right back down. Indeed, indeed. So I read that you have a copper brew house from built in 1964. And I was curious, that was your upgrade from your earliest system, right? And yeah. why did you go with this uh, giant copper brew house from Germany? It's beautiful, but why that as opposed to some other more modern built, whatever, from uh, one of the uh, other places out there building modern breweries? I probably should blame my old boss, John McDonald, for this because he had always thought that's how he got his first brew house was going over to Germany, and he'd always talked about it. It was always a dream of mine. I just love these things. And, you know, the fact is breweries of that size, so this is 66 barrels in Germany, are going under or were going under. I think most of them are gone now. And it's just pennies on the dollar. The reality is the price I paid may have barely been more than the scrap value of the copper. Wow. Wow. Okay. okay. Well, it is beautiful. Go for it. it is. Yeah. I've yes. seen the picture now, of it. Wow. Yeah. Now, now getting it over and installed, that's the, where the expense <laughs> is. But <laughs> yeah. um, even then, it's I know, uh, you know, New Glarus Brewing's got a similar one. and But they've got the outer shell. And inside, it's a modern stainless one. And so when they were taking that apart, they looked at me and they're like, before they started breaking it down. It's like, are you using it or are you just using the other part? Because they needed to know how careful they needed to be. <laughs> and we've started brewing a lager, a Karsten lager on there. And we just laugh because we feel like the German equipment is happier when it's brewing a lager. I could see that. Sure. <laughs> the spirit of the brew house, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I have to wonder with something like that, because I know that the, the pot stills make a difference when you're distilling. What does that kind of a brew house, does it contribute something different to making beer or is it just all the same thing basically in the end? I think, you know, there are things that the heat transfer on it is still great. I think if you look at, at the new ones, they've adapted to accommodate the fact that stainless is a much more durable metal that holds up better for you, but it doesn't necessarily work as well as copper. So you'll see cheater bars of copper inside of a kettle of a brand new, you know, oh, brand, brand interesting. new brew Okay. House. And it's because they learned very quickly that copper was a nutrient that the yeast actually needed. Okay. Oh, and there so we go. When, yeah. So when, when they first switched over to stainless, they started having problems and figured out. So if you're at one of the really big boys, and I won't say anybody's name, but the really big boys, and, and they'll, you'll see them walk up to the kettle and add something. <laughs> and and they're putting in a little zinc and copper. A little, little bit of those. Oh, how about that? You know, I visited uh, Sierra Nevada in Mills River, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville. They've got just this huge, like, three-story room, big windows, and 
I think it's two of the big copper brew houses there. But I think I heard the same thing, like you said, with New Glarus, that it's a copper shell with an actual stainless interior there. But, boy, it sure makes for a nice picture, yeah. right? nice scene there. Yeah. It's really gorgeous to see that. <laughs> it's so. beautiful. Our brew house is actually the slightly older sister to Sierra Nevada's brew house number one, Chico. All right. That's one of the great things in the brewing world is when we brought that in, you know, I reached out to Sierra Nevada and said, okay, this, this monstrosity of 1960s technology, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about this? And, right. and they came back and it's like, here's how we're handling it and, you know, trying to keep it alive for as long, as long as you can. So it was, it was really useful. Keep it going. Good stuff. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Switchback Brewing. Cobb County, Georgia is home to 17 unique craft beverage makers. This March, Cobb Travel and Tourism and Fireside Natural Gas bring you Bubbles and Brews Craft Beverage Month. Visit participating locations to get your Brew Pass passport and sample the featured brews. Make sure to get your Brew Pass stamped and cast your vote for your favorites and a chance to win sweet prizes all month long. Celebrate with Cobb's best craft beverage makers throughout the month of March. Get more info now at bubblesandbrews.com. Craft beer deserves craft glass. Thick Boys Glass has curated an online collective of glass artisans around the USA to bring you hand-blown beer glassware. These unique glasses are stylish and durable and have plenty of room to hold a tall boy of your favorite beer. Use code BEERGUYS at thickboysglass.com to get 15% off your order. Thick Boys Glass, that's T-H-I-C-C-B-O-I-S glass.com. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram now back to the beer guys radio show Shake it back. welcome back to the beer guys radio show i want to give a quick shout out to one of our great radio affiliates wvmt 620 am and 96.3 fm in burlington vermont catch beer guys radio on wvmt every saturday at 1 p.m now let's get back to smoke beer talk with switchback brewing it's about to get smoky brian uh, finally, we're, we're diving been, into this. The we're air go has this. been too clean it so has. far. Yeah. So we're going to go. Bill, you know, the first thing I want to mention is one thing you sent us along with the beers. You sent us a sensory kit, which was super cool. And we have four little cups of different malts here. And we have a guide, a sensory guide. And one thing I got to ask about, we got a book of matches, a box of matches. <laughs> See, I was thinking these are probably for me to use to trim Brian's beard. Is that correct? That's exactly so, right. All yes. right. Good I deal. thought we were supposed to roast the individual grains, you know, while we were <laughs> so drinking the beers. Them. Yeah, right. Hand right smoked. Here. Yeah, Each hand grain. smoked. Each grain. There is so. nothing more boutique or handcrafted than hand smoked hand grains smoked. individually over a match. <laughs> that sounds that sounds nice. It's going to be an expensive bottle, though. So. Oh, sure. Yeah. But, Bill, your smoke beers all fall under your Flynn on Fire series, correct? That is correct. So where did the name Flynn on Fire come from? What's the origins there? The brewery's located on Flynn Avenue, so that's where okay. the Flynn comes all right. from. All right. And the history of our area, it, it was a horse track, and uh, the building next to ours was a film production company out of Quebec and, and then a hardware store. And the whole area during you know the early 1900s, burned down like three times oh, oh okay all right <laughs> it just yeah. just had a huge habit of that little industrial district just caught fire all the time so that's where it all generates from it's like we're in the area that used to burn down all all of it and so it's like we're flint on fire we're smoke beers i was gonna choke about have the the fire department never been called out to the brewery but now i'm like that nah, maybe not, not, maybe, not i don't want to jinx it joke. i don't want to joke about <laughs> you know that. i heard that, talking about that burning down several times i was listening to a history podcast recently and they were talking about the great chicago fire and they said one of the reasons there is for the fire being as bad as it was at the time everything was wood sidewalks oh, yeah. buildings they said even some of the newer buildings that may have like a concrete facade a bunch of the internals would still be wood. So they were going through a drought in the area. It was basically just 
a huge fire pit. It was just a big timber bonfire everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So stuff would burn down really easy if something caught fire. It's true. Yes. Turns out yeah. wood burns well, too. I've heard that. I have heard that. <laughs> well, Bill, we have moved on to the Saison, but before we dive into that, we drank your Uncle Dunkel here. So can you tell us a little bit about that beer? Yeah, so Uncle Dunkel is a, a smoked Dunkel Hefeweizen, and worked through it with using the. Did we agree it's Grodzitski? I think that's what we're going to we're going to go with that. Yeah, I, I think those so. who know will know what we're talking about, yeah. even if we say it wrong. To borrow their ingredient, which is a smoked wheat malt, oak smoked, and we've learned that the oak smoke is a little gentler, which I think works really well for a wheat beer anyway, and put that. You know, and, and just kind of created that and used a, a Weizen yeast that we selected that was a little less banana y than normal. Okay. I will yeah. be a little a little more clove heavy, but uh, the reality is the bananas still come through when this stuff first pops out. I think the first comment someone said was it was like banana bread had just come out of the oven. That sounds good. Good, good yeah. pop yeah. there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice and warming. And I think you picked up on a lot of what Flint on Fire is all about, which is. There's smoke in there, but it's not the defining characteristic of the Dunkel Hefe bites. Right. And looking here at the guide you gave us, so the Uncle Dunkel has 42% smoked malt, correct? Yeah. From the outside looking in, if someone told me this beer has 42% smoked malt, I would avoid it like the play because I would expect that to be very dominant smoke. Yeah. And obviously we're learning through all of this and the phase is, uh, with all of the the Cara Munich and Carafa dark malts in it from the Dunkel, that holds off that smoke character quite a bit, and you can get away with it being much stronger than you'd imagine. It doesn't dominate the palate. Not at all. And I always, as a home brewer, always thought that if you, you went beyond like about 5% smoked malt in anything, you were asking for something that's undrinkable, basically, or... Something that's basically barbecue sauce with alcohol in it or something like that. <laughs> barbecue sauce. Yeah, exactly. So uh, now, Bill, I see here you mentioned that you use kind of some of the bigger malts like the Wireman and such. Is there a craft malt industry in Vermont? Have you ever developed your own smoked malt? Not our own smoked malt. We do have a burgeoning maltster coming on Peterson's, uh, who's, but no smoke from him yet. But, uh, but, just like our hop farms up here, we're developing a lot more homegrown stuff as we go. It's still fairly small. It's a little bit difficult to for quantity if you're making like a major batch all year long as opposed to one-offs. One-offs are fine, but sure, it's developing and the quality just keeps going up leaps and bounds every year, which is great because it is amazing. And I think everybody's been learning this. The hard way is, you know, whether it's Yakima, Washington, or wherever they're making malt, is how much infrastructure is actually needed to help everybody out, to hold the quality, and and just the weird tools they need to make it work. Yeah, it's a definite retooling from what the typical the situation would be for a maltster, I would imagine. That's we've seen. We just had our first malt house open here in Georgia. And I know he said that, hey, just getting this up and getting this going is a challenge. We also have a friend that's a hop farmer, and he was talking about, you know, growing hops is one thing, but when you go to dry and package them, it adds a whole new layer of regulation to things. Oh, yeah. So there, there's just a whole lot of things to go into that we may not think of, you know, on the outside looking in. It just seems like a simple process to go from this to this, but uh, not always the case. So, Bill, did you say that you have smoked any of your of your own malts, or is that purely purely coming in from uh, other sources? Yeah, so far I've anchored myself onto onto Wireman. They've been really helpful, and, and haven't gone down that next step. Okay, so no small batch smoking because that would be quite interesting. I can see it in the future, you know, with like some apple wood, that kind of thing that sure. they don't do yeah, in Germany. Yeah. That's well, we've got a, a monster out of Asheville that works with a lot of the Southeast breweries and they worked, I think it was a brewery in Georgia. They worked with, they made a pecan wood smoked wheat malt. That's right. And yeah. It, it ended up being so good that they started carrying it for other breweries. It's on a reg- yeah, yeah. A regular list. Yeah. The second you said there, Georgia doing some smoke, I was in my mind. I'm like, oh, I want pecan wood smoked malt. There you go. See, River Bend Malt House. It exists. They can, they can, can hook have you it. up. So sure enough. The next Flint on Fire right there. Yep. 
I mean, Flint on Fire is going to have a, a hundred varieties before this is all through. It just never stops. I'm telling you, Keep we're, it up going. To ten, we're up to 10 already. So <laughs> That's a lot. Southern Smoke. We've even got a name for you there, there Bill. Yes. So we've got this done, man. We've got Thank it. Thank you. Because I do, I, I think I've already told you this. I need help with names. I'm a horrible namer. Most of Brian's name ideas are bad, <laughs> but we hit a good one every now and then. So we, we actually had a brewery not long ago that we just made some jokes in passing. And like three months later, we see one of them. One of them a became name. a beer. So it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> so you mentioned kind of the Vermont hops in that. Has the, have you ever smoked any hops or, or used any smoked hops? I think I've heard that before. No, no, I have not heard of smoked hops. Okay. Oh, happens. Oh, no. They'll smoke everything. That may oh, be yeah. in the South. To be fair, a lot of the references were on homebrew forums, and it was referencing somebody professionally who had done it, but then discontinued it. So I was intrigued by that. I, okay. I could not get far enough down the Maybe rabbit hole to find done, out. it's been done, but it was a really bad idea. It may have been a terrible well, idea, okay. but how else do you know? And I can tell you, we make a smoked IPA called Smoke 40. It is, I think I say on our website, you know, we've accomplished the impossible by marrying smoke to an IPA because it doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, see, that's what add coffee to it. Smoked coffee IPA. Boom. Okay. See, <laughs> see what I mean, Bill? The ideas just get the more they go, man. The more they go. Now, here's the thing: I've had some really, really good coffee IPAs, and I've had a ton of really bad coffee IPAs. But when it sure. when it hits, it's great. Add a little smoke to it. I don't see a problem there. That's when you get them seems together good. there. When yeah. lightning strikes. You know, I don't know. It's <laughs> I just assume, Brian, we should just simply not trust what you say. <laughs> probably. It just so. seems like the safest route to take with it's things. It's probably safe. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Switchback Brewing. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. Looking for a great craft beer to enjoy at home? Get your beer to go at The Nest in Kennesaw, Georgia. Choose from their 48 taps to enjoy there with some tasty barbecue and take some home with you for later. Grab a crispy pilsner, a nice tart sour, or a bold stout to sit by the fire. Just bring your growler in and choose a favorite or two to take with you. It's our beer, your growler, at The Nest for your brews to go. Check out the beer and food menus before you visit at thenestkennesaw.com. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons get cool perks like Beer Guys swag and commercial-free episodes. Now let's get back to Switchback Brewing and Smoked Beers. Smoked Beers. So, uh, Bill, we have opened... Your black strap ale. In this one on the smokeometer, we have a 70%. Oh, yeah. Um, we discussed it a little bit just before we came back on air here. And Brian decided it's delicious. Oh, it it's is. It's everything he wants out of it's life. It's 30% away from perfect. It is, right? Like you it's can trying, see it right man. on the it's label. Trying. For me, this one crossed the line. This is a little too much smoke for me in this. But something that's interesting, we talked a little bit. There's a peat note in this one, definitely. Definitely get the peaty character. Something that's really interesting, I enjoy like Lagavulin Scotch with the peaty character to it. But in the beer, it's a little too much for me. And Bill, you mentioned that it's kind of the other way around for you, correct? Yeah. Yeah, bring it in the beer, but not so much in the scotch, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I could do more smoke in the beer. Okay. Okay. More smoke, but uh, he's a McAllen fellow, we found out. Not yeah. so much into the peat and smoke. Right. So that makes, interesting. I'm consistent. Interesting. Of all of us, 
Drink I'm going to point all. out. Drink it all, I'm right? Gonna, I, I'm drinking the smoke and the peat everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, now you've got the the barrel age, and it's, it's, uh, it was Asian whiskey barrels Ooh. from a micro distillery here. I think it was Stonecutters up here in Vermont. So okay. It's a high alcohol version of our regular Blackstrap Ale. So, which is fascinating work to do as to when you increase the intensity, it's like you realize you don't want to in- increase the intensity of everything. You know, you're, you're up in your alcohol, yeah. but how much do you want your flavors to increase? Because it can go over the top real fast. And so that was a, it was a really fun challenge, but the whole Blackstrap idea was that was the first Flint on Fire beer, smoke beer that I made that wasn't a traditional style. So that's the first one where I just took an idea and it was my time in Kansas City at Boulevard Brewing saying, you know, barbecue, smoke, sweet, smoke and sweet. Okay. And, uh, and that's what we went with. So we, we dump a bunch of dark brown sugar into the kettle in there to draw out that molasses to come carry through and into the end of it. This is one where I can definitely see the appeal and the complexity to it and the quality of it, even though it's not for my palate necessarily. All those flavors that you're talking about there, I definitely get it. You know, I mm-hmm. definitely see it all there. So, And Blackstrap, not the, the barrel aged, although people just adore it, but the Blackstrap formulation is surprisingly acceptable to the folks that are most skeptical about smoked beers. Okay. Yeah. I'll accept him. So uh, yeah. I, I'm curious. So when you put it into barrels, did you have to dial up or dial back the smoke for this beer? Because it affects the impact of that component, right? Yeah. The smoke we kept, I think I pumped it up a little bit more. But what I backed off on was um, some of the caramel malts, like dark crystal malt chocolate. It was, it was okay. becoming overbearing if you just increased it. And kind of held that back to let the other flavors come through. But as far as the smoke goes, that kind of took the place, so to speak, of what we were backing off on. And by backing off, it means just not increasing it, I should say. Oh, <laughs> just holding it steady. So yeah. you, you mentioned this was inspired by your time in Kansas City with Boulevard. Boulevard. Yeah. 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 What, was that kind of the inspiration right there, being there for getting into smoke beers? Or I'm curious... You really, really have focused on the smoked beers. Where did that passion come from? Nobody's sure, except I can tell you. That <laughs> All right. That yeah. Basically, what's happening is I'm I'm thinking about where I want to go with some new beers, and you know the market is full up of double IPAs and even full up of sours and stuff. And it's like, boy, what's out there? And I and I see an article about smoked beers, and and I just my palate starts watering, and I mention it to uh, my longest term employee Gretchen and we have a deal here at Switchback I decided that anybody that could continue to work with me for 10 years was going to have to have some kind of reward for that and so any employee that makes it 10 years their 10 year uh, bonus is a all expense paid trip to Germany oh nice and very nice and oh. and there's only one rule to it is there's there's a very small brewery in a small farming town that they have to go to and drink their beer cuz it's that fantastic <laughs> That's just brutal. You have to go to Germany and you have to drink this beer. This beer, yes. Okay, okay you can fine. do everything else, but you also have to drink this. Have beer. to go drink this yes, beer. You have to do that. But she looked at me and she said, "I went to Bomberg and I fell in love with the smoked beers to the point of when I left to the other towns, I kept feeling like there was something missing in my beer." And I just looked at that and I said, let's give it a try. And so, you know, we did a smoked Meritzen to start with. And once we got that going, it was really fun watching like our taproom public come in and be pretty skeptical. And then it's that neat thing where you watch everybody kind of going, yeah, I don't think that's for me. And then you watch the sales of it and it keeps getting better and keeps getting better. And then you got some regulars walking in saying, I want another one of those. And I said, I think we got something going here. And, and I immediately just had that idea in my head of, I want to treat this like an American craft brewer, which is I'm going to do the traditional styles, but then I'm going out on my own and I'm going to just see what I can do with this stuff. That sounds like Brian's philosophy. Yes. With beer. Yeah, very (laughs) much so. Just go for it and get out there. Yeah, I'm on board with this. On board. You're you're all about it. I'm 100% on board. So I know that the malts are a big part of brewing. Do you make any special selection as far as yeast go for the smoked beers opposed to non-smoked? No. Okay. All right. 
Simple enough. Simple enough. No special considerations there. I got to say, so we just had our Saison show. We talked about food pairings and how Saisons are just one of the finest beers for pairing with food. But we had not considered smoked Saisons. We had not. Previously. So what would you pair this Bisonne that we had earlier with in terms of food? My favorite is just a really ripe, stinky cheese. (laughs) Okay. You know, Vermont up here, you know, big dairy state and and actually probably in the U.S. is at the forefront of artisanal cheese making. And we've got some really interesting cave age cheeses and stuff up here and uh, and a lot of goat cheeses and whatnot. And I'm telling you, you get, and I say it because we're doing a French style saison. So I feel like I'm in the French countryside, you know, and there's some goats and chickens running around and I'm looking over the countryside. And everything smells like a goat, the, the, the beer, <laughs> the beer, the cheese, the goats, and all I need is, you know, my baguette and, and some stinky cheese. And man, I, that's just heaven, right? Baguette, yeah, stinky cheese, the <laughs> wafting of goat in the air. Little smoke saison. <laughs> it sounds like heaven Perfect. to me, Bill. It does. Absolutely. <laughs> so I know that you've got, I think, 10 smoked beers, which uh, I think you said by your research, the most of any brewery in the U.S., correct? Yes. Okay. Now, I see on your smokeometer, we go up to a 76%. Can you do or do you plan to do a 100% smoke malt beer? I think I am. Okay. All right. But the only reason the 76 is the highest right now is because it's a stout, and I have to have some dark roasted malts in there sure. to make it a stout. <laughs> I don't have any room for any more smoke. So that's where I think you're going to get into that licking the ashtray thing. And I, but I am curious <laughs> yeah. about it because, there you go. because I think there's going to be some folks that like it. I, I was talking about that and saying, so we call it the gates of Hellas. It's our smoked Hellas and it's our lowest smokeometer. It's only 25. And it's the gates of Hellas because we think of it as the gateway smoked beer. It's the one to, to start with and to, to get a feel for. That and, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But now I'm like, maybe we go for it and just really do a big one for the smoke heads and, uh, you know, call it. Just knock it out. Yeah. So how do you like Hellas Bent as my name? There you go. No, that sounds great. I think you got it. Absolutely. Can you smoke a dark malt? Is that on the market? Anybody could smoke it, but is that something that could be acquired, a smoke darker malt? Never seen one. I just can't imagine what it would even do because, you know, dark malts are practically nothing but dust already they've been roasted so long yeah i'm excited by the idea i won't lie just add it straight in there get one of those cocktail guns that shoots smoke (laughs) and just smoke the smoked beer just bubble it through just run it carbonate it yeah co2 and smoke (laughs) that's right right into the beer smoked co2 have you ever smoked co2 before i have not Not, are you asking me you were looking at me i bet Uh, you were talking to bill you know what i'm asking everybody in the room is anybody's ever done that i want to hear about it No more beer for Brian, Bill. (laughs) I think we're going to cut him off there. So, Well, Bill, we are about out of time there. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. 20th anniversary coming up very soon. We didn't get a chance to talk about that a lot, but congratulations on 20 years there at Switchback. And uh, if people want to know more about what's going on at the brewery, what is the best way to follow along? Oh, you probably just hop on our Instagram more than anything, I guess, Instagram, Facebook, and We're pretty good about it. Ready to rock. Good deal. Thanks, Bill. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Join us next week as we talk with Braxton Brewing. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. Cheers.